Okay. Okay, let's uh, let's pray, right? Okay. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you. We bless your name, God. We bless your name. Let's just begin to just praise him. Thank him for this day. Thank him for his presence in our lives. Uh, let's thank him for who he is. Yes, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. Without your presence, where would we be? Father God, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you've given us life and life in its fullness. Lord, you've come to give, oh God. We thank you. We thank you that you lead us as a good shepherd. We thank you that you speak to us. Lord, whenever you speak, oh Father God, you create something in us, Lord. You establish something in us, Lord. You remove those things that need to be removed in us, Father God. We thank you, Lord. Yes, Master, today, this morning, oh God, we commit ourselves into your mighty hands this whole day, Father God, and all the sessions, Lord. We pray, Father God, that you would speak to us. We pray, Father God, that there would be Lord, something that, that of your life that is imparted in us, Master God. We pray for freshness. We pray for your anointing. Yes, Lord, we thank you. And we pray that you would shape us, mold us, Lord, into who you want us to be, Master. We thank you. We give you all the praise at this time, Father God. We give you all the glory at this time. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So last class, we looked at uh, prophetic worship, right? We looked at... Uh, how prophetic worship is uh, something that is um, something something that is there in scripture. You know, it's not something that is uh, some contemporary trend, right? But it's uh, it is there in scripture, right from the tabernacle that David built, and we see that prophecy and music and uh, anointing of God, uh, everything going together, right? Coming together in the uh, in the tabernacle, right? And so um, you also saw that what whatever uh, prophetic word or whatever prophecy actually fulfills, right, or, or brings to pass in our lives, the same thing, the prophetic song or prophetic worship will also accomplish, right? And uh, so it's uh, it's something that we uh, should intentionally enter into, uh, and we can intentionally walk in. And uh, and and that's something like just all the other expressions of, you know, uh, worship, like the physical expression of worship, and and us really going after the pursuing the presence of God, you know, these are some things that we need to intentionally pursue, go after, right, in our lives, right. So um, so that's something of an encouragement for us. Okay. So now we move on to uh, the next chapter, which is uh, about a lifestyle of worship. Okay. So. Um, let me just share that screen. Okay, so we're looking at a lifestyle of worship. So what is what do we mean by lifestyle? And somebody says, uh, no, lifestyle, what does it mean? The way we live daily, the, the choices we make daily, right? Um, how we spend our life, the kind of work that we do, everything, right? Uh, the kind of food that we uh, wear, the, the kind of entertainment or leisure that we have, everything put together is our lifestyle, our style of living, right? Our way of living, right? So today we're just going to consider, you know, how worship can be a lifestyle, right? Because we can sometimes so box this whole thing of worshiping God into a time, event, and place. Right? Many times we, whether it's personal worship or even corporate worship, we can say, okay, today I spend so much time worshiping. Or, you know, we gathered together and we really pursued God in worship. We experience the presence of God, and we can actually put it to certain days, or even if you want to put it daily, we can we can actually, you know, sometimes restrict this whole aspect of worship into a certain time, certain time, right? Maybe one hour, two hours, whatever it is, extended time of worship, and so on. But worship is also bigger than that, right? Because worship is recognition of who God is. 
acknowledgement of who God is, because his worship is surrender to God, because worship is, um, you know, um, acknowledging that he is the creator, that he is who he said he is, and us surrendering, yielding to God, we see that worship cannot be just confined to a time, even if it's an extended time. Right? We see that it has to be really part of our life. Right? It has to be a lifestyle. Right? So in what way can worship be part of our lifestyle? Practically speaking, how can we live a life of worship? And so what does the word of God say uh, about it? Right. So, so that is what we're going to see. So when we say lifestyle, worship is a lifestyle. Worship, worship is a lifestyle. You know, some of these scriptures really bring to light how it can be a lifestyle, how it can be part of our choices, how it can be part of how we live our life. Okay, So let's look at this verse, Hebrews chapter 13. Okay, We look at that verse, Hebrews chapter 13 and 15, to, to really bring out how we need to offer worship and praise to God and how it is like bringing a sacrifice to God. You know, that's how we, that's how we studied this verse. Right? Hebrews 13 verse 15 says, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. And what is it? It is a fruit of our lips, which means something that we say out, something that we acknowledge, something that we declare. Right? Well, that is, that is the truth. Verse 16 it says, But do not forget to do good and to share. Okay, so the writer of Hebrews is remind, reminding, okay, this is what you need to do continually, you know, bring before him the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of our lips, something that you actually, out of our heart, and you say it with your mouth or sing it. It is the fruit of our lips. But he goes on to say, but do not forget. He's reminding us, don't forget to do good and to share. Right? Don't forget to do good things. Don't forget to share. Don't forget to be kind and to be generous. And what does he say? For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. He uses the same word there. Sacrifice of praise, being kind, and, and, being, uh, and being generous and sharing. He says, but with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Okay. So he's drawing a parallel between offering up the fruit of our lips, which is the sacrifice of praise, and being kind and being generous and sharing, which is again a sacrifice. You're bringing forth that sacrifice. So he's saying with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Okay, God is well pleased. Right. So the good referring to being kind and generous. So how are some practical ways by which we can actually say, okay, I'm bringing this sacrifice to God. I'm having this lifestyle of worship. By being good and kind and so on. Okay, one is when we speak the truth with others. Right? When we speak the truth with others, but when we speak the truth in love, right? With kindness. Let's look at Ephesians 4 and verse 15. Okay. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. Right. Okay. What does it say? But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him or into him who is the head Christ. Okay. So being kind to others, we can be kind to others in our words as a, as a starting point. Right? Be kind to others in our words, in the words that we speak to them. Okay. Being kind. Now, is it easy or difficult? At times, it's easy when you're in a good mood, right? When everything is going fine, when everybody is happy, and when nobody is saying anything bad against you, or they're not doing anything bad against you, it's good. Today, as I was coming, one person, one student, <laughs> Krishna Jayanti student, he just came on his bike, hit the bumper, and just kept going. So I chased him. Chased him, and I said, what? You just hit it and you kept going. And he said, sorry, bro. Sorry. You know, I'm really sorry. I said, what? You know, I'm going on the left side. Oh, where else can I go? You just came into the thing and you hit the... And you know, being the car it is, it just the bumper just 
came out of the whole thing, you know, on the on the right side of the car. Now, did I speak kind words? What do you think? No, I, I spoke harsh words. I said, what, what are you doing? Right? But I could have spoken harsher words. God really held me back. Said, Who are you? Where are you going? Right? What are you called to do? All these things came to my mind. I said, okay, let's go. Right. So, difficult times, challenging times, it's difficult to speak kind words. Right? We're not saying that. We're always saying, you know, some uh, you know kind words irrespective of or insincerity you know sometimes we can speak kind words uh, without meaning it or we can speak kind words when we are feeling otherwise right? we need to sp so that's why Ephesians 4:15 says speak the truth but you speak it in love you know? we can be firm we can be assertive but we can be loving right think about it you can be firm we can be assertive and we can be kind at the same time, right? And we, we, we need to say how we are feeling. Hey, this is not right. We need to speak justice, right? We need to be fair. God is a God of justice. So we need to say if something is not, that is why the Bible says speak it in, in truth, which means if something is not right, you need to say that it's not right. You know, if something is wrong, you know, because truth doesn't mean that we overlook whatever whatever someone does as wrong we say that it is it is it is correct right? so that is not truth or to be in to speak in love does not mean if somebody is doing the wrong thing you say no it is it is okay. it is the correct thing that is not it right we need to address it we need to speak that is why the bible says speak the speak the truth speak the speak love or speak in love but you speak it in truth and in love right Okay, so how else can we? The same chapter, you know, if you look, look at verse 29, right? Ephesians 4 and verse 29, it says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Okay, saying, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Okay, but what is good for um, necessary hearing, a necessary what is sorry, what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. There's something that we can learn from this, right? So he, first of all, he's saying, don't do this. What is it? Don't speak corrupt words. Right? It can be words that hurt. It can be words that break a person. Right? The proverbs talks about the fact that you know the, the words can actually break. Uh, even the hardest of bones, you know, it's like that. Some words are like that. And Proverbs also talks about the fact that there are, there are some who speak like the spear, piercings of the sword. Right? So words have that kind of a effect on people. Right? But he's saying here, don't speak corrupt words. You know, it could be words that are profane, right? unholy. So when, when we think of corrupt words, that's what comes to our mind first. You know, words that are bad, bad language profane words, unholy words, right? So, yes, definitely we know for sure that that is, that is bad. But also, when it comes to speaking, you know, words of faith, words that align with truth, words that are sincere, right? So he's saying, what is, uh, what is good for necessary edification? So which means words can actually, what is edification? Edification. To build, right? To bring some kind of a progress in people, right? To build. So, what about speaking words that build? So, what is, you speak what is good for necessary edification. It, let's speak words that build up people. But the next part is also interesting, the last part of it, that it may impart grace to the hearer. Okay. What do you understand from the word grace? What does grace mean? Huh? We use grace, right? Uh, oh, the grace of God, I received grace. We use it very often. So what does the word um, grace mean? Divine? 
divine favor so what does that mean divine favor okay shani also says favor so what does it mean favor okay so something that we don't deserve but we have been given some good thing something good okay something good that we don't deserve but we have been given that so that so you know the, the word unmerited is used which means something that is undeserving or unmerited and that that is given right so i think uh, you know when we were in school we were given grace marks right how many of you have received grace marks those who didn't receive great marks were they probably great students right probably you performed very well you did very well in your exams i've got grace marks right so you need two marks to pass and you passed in all the subjects but this particular subject you've not you know so the teacher gives if the teacher is in a good mood and if you you know you just go and ask and request they give grace marks plus two and that's like wow thank you lord you know then they write that in the red ink plus 2 and then put their signature that's it you passed right and so i remember going and asking right this was uh, you know i forget which class i probably 8th or 9th and i i failed in in the language class just i i had studied tamil so i failed in that and so 38 and so i'm asking the teacher and because you know i'm just thinking in my mind you no know, if i take the report card with that f what will happen you know how can i get signature from my father how will he sign it and what will happen i'm just thinking of all that i'm i'm in real fear and trembling but uh, but there are these experts you know seasoned guys in class they're saying hey only one subject no why are you so scared you know they and they're like no i'm so disappointed uh, and then i go to the teacher and ask and the teacher is looking at the paper you know what have you written <laughs> and she's saying what why why didn't you study this why didn't you study that and then finally you know puts that plus 2 have you passed everything yeah i got good marks okay plus 2 and then pass and then you just it's it's not something that you deserve because that paper did not deserve that plus 2 right but then she gave that and that is the favor that you received unmerited undeserved okay but what else is grace is it only only uh, unmerited favor what else is grace sorry excellent chance so that's the first thing you know it's another another opportunity that you've been given right so what what else is grace grace you know the greek word used there is charis which means is a free gift right it's a free gift so whenever the bible talks about the gifts of the spirit it's not something that you earn right it's not something that you perform and you earn but it's something that is given freely and it's called charis which is gifts of grace so that is also grace when we use the word grace it it talks about the gifts the gifts of god the spiritual gifts and so on right like like you already said grace is also divine enablement divine character right so the holy spirit enables us to live like christ or to live christ like lives right to be transformed to christ likeness so it's a divine enablement empowerment right the holy spirit empowers us to live or to to ex, to uh, express divine character right so that's the third thing so here if you look at the context of ephesians 4:15 is talking about is talking about that right? that there is an impartation impartation means transfer transmission right so when we speak those words those kind words or edifying words it says that they it might lead to necessary edifications good for necessary edification that in let me impart or that there can be a transfer of grace of divine empowerment to whom to the hearer to one who's listening to one who's actually the recipient of your of your words right hearing your words so so the thing is this you know it works both ways and that is why when we declare the word when we confess the word there is a divine impartation impartation of grace and since we are confessing god's word over ourselves 
we are actually recipients of this impartation of grace divine empowerment for ourselves when we when we praise god when we worship god when we when we declare the truth about who we are to god who god has called us to be there is a divine empowerment there is a divine uh, the transmission of that grace right so it says here you speak you speak edifying words don't speak corrupt words speak edifying words it can actually be bring about a transfer of grace into a person's life there is something spiritual there's something supernatural happening when because and the bible calls it the impartation of grace right so as a lifestyle of worship you know, how did the lord respond to persecution how did the lord respond and how did he what did he teach us he says bless those who curse he says bless those who curse right which means somebody is giving a negative blessing saying you will never do well this is imagine the scenario that is how it is he's not even saying that you know he's not ignoring you or you know he's just saying something very negative right about you getting very personal about you and saying you you will never do well or you are like this and the bible and the lord is saying bless those who curse right so we really need the holy spirit we really need his strength and we really need to put to death the things of the flesh in order to live such yeah yeah stephen you have a question stephen jiru um i think your camera is also on bro okay i guess that was my mistake okay so we need really need the power of god we need we really need the you know power of the holy spirit the leading of the holy spirit in order to bless release an impartation of grace to those who do not who cannot or who are, who are maybe ignorance or maybe intentionally they are you know releasing something which is opposite of blessing which is a curse so but we are called to do that we are invited to do that and this lifestyle of worship is for each one of us just like how each one of us are commanded to praise god commanded to worship god designed to praise god designed to worship him the same way we are also designed commanded created to live a lifestyle of worship right so this is this is not restricted to something that we do in church right this is not restricted to something that we have during our quiet time but this is this is open to how we live our lives 24/7 right so you know when you when you go to the doctor get a check up and then uh some things are easy the doctor says you know just take this take these tablets take these tablets twice a day three days you'll be fine now that's something we just need to discipline remember to do that and that will be fine but sometimes the doctor says something challenging he says hey, you need you need a lifestyle change he's saying this is how you need you know you need to live you need a lifestyle change you need to have more vegetables in your diet and maybe you're a person who does not think who thinks that vegetables are for animals goats right and then he says no you you need vegetables in your diet vegetables and fruits you need to sleep early get up early and all these kind these are lifestyle changes and we are not very happy with that right? we are happy with okay just doctor just give me an injection i'll be fine or just give me those tablets i'll i'll just do that but when the doctor says no no this is something that you need to do throughout your life every day 24/7 you know you need to be mindful then we are not very happy we like you know we say you know the doctors saying this i need to do this it's a lifestyle change lifestyle changes are not you know very easy on our flesh right? and that is why we need to you know take or lean into and receive the grace of god the power of the holy spirit in order to do this right so the first thing that we see is that you know kindness in our words the second thing is kindness in our actions right and that goes without saying that just flows out of the kind of conversations and everything that kindness in our actions right uh, blessing those who curse is also kindness in action because uh, you know act maybe you know thoughts come you know to take revenge thought come to um to maybe stop somebody from receiving good 
right? He he did this, she did this, and therefore, you know, I'm going to prevent that, block them from receiving something good. Thoughts come, right? And we do that. We step in and do that. You, know, you did this, therefore, I'm going to do this to you. You know, action. We take revenge, right? So being kind in our action, in what we do, having acts of kindness. Um, you know, uh, I remember, and the next thing also, you know, being generous with our resources, just uh, the three and four, you know, these things flow together. I remember reading an article, uh, you know, not too long ago um, in the newspapers, and it was, this was about this man who used to sit in one of these petrol bunks, right? Uh, and he would he would be there uh, towards the um, uh, late night, like the bunk would have closed, and he'll be there, and he'll sit there with uh, two liters of petrol. Okay, so why why is he doing that? He, and he and and, and the newspaper said that he does it daily, right? And they they were, they took I, we don't I do some time back, right? So um, he used to sit there daily with two liters of petrol in in his you know those pet bottles, and the reason is this. There would be people who would come there, you know, pushing their bike, come into the come into the bunk uh, late at night, thinking the bunk will be open. You know, that's the last resort. They come there, and they realize that bunk is already closed, right? And so he sits with the with that petrol, and he says, you know, you take it, right? and uh, he doesn't sell it, but he gives it, and whatever money they give, he again buys, and then he he does that, right? And a random act of kindness, kind, kind. It's taking a lot out of him, right? It's it's sacrificial. Maybe he's sacrificing his sleep, the comfort of being at home, or you know, maybe out in the cold, or you know, uh, when it's raining and all that. But he's doing that for something. I don't know what the papers didn't talk about. You know why, what, uh, you know. But he just said, "I just want to do this," and whatever money he's getting, he's just putting it back into this, and he's doing it. Kind act, an act of generosity, right? Without expecting anything in return, right? And God is well pleased. That's the verse that we saw, right? Hebrews 13, verse 16, that God is well pleased to share, to do good, to be kind, to be generous. God is well pleased with such sacrifices. So even as we you know, even as we prepare ourselves, or even as we say, you know, I want to be a worshiper of the God of the Lord. I'm designed to worship. This is something that we need to think about. You know, it's more than just a song. It's more than just a time that we gather together, or time that we say, okay, this time I'm allotting to see God. And you know, while it's all that, it is important, but it's more than that. It goes beyond that. Right? It is a manner of living, and this is it, to do good, to be generous, and to share. Right? Um, and when we are generous, when we say generous with our resources, what are the resources that we have? What is it that we can think of when we say resources? Definitely money. Right? Money is a resource. Uh, money is something that we can use. We can help people with money. Money, we can be generous with money. Money is a resource, right? Also, time. Like time is a precious resource, right? So, how much time do we all have? 24 hours in a day, but how much time do you personally have in your life, in your lifetime? Right? There is a certain amount, okay? So, maybe you can even calculate and uh, you can calculate, okay, I want to live to be 100. How many of you are saying that? Let's assume that everybody wants to live to be 100, right? So you can actually do that exercise. 100 into 365. Somebody calculate and just write down. Maybe you can write down. <clears throat> 365, 0, 0, right? 100 into 365, so many days. Is that what it is? Just put it down, put it down. OK. How much is 36,000? 500? That's all. This is. If you want to live to be 100, and we'll have to minus our age there. Okay, so you do that. Okay, 100 minus, I want everybody to write down. 100 minus, what is your age now? You might be, whatever, 22, 25, 
30, whatever. Just write that. Write that down. 100 minus your age, your present age. Okay. I, I want you to write down in your page. I want you to see it. Right? Don't you don't have to show others, but you do it. Okay. Um, all those who are online also as well. Okay. So 100 minus. Okay, somebody good, good with math. Okay, your your age, right? You've written it down. Okay. So that into 365. Because 365 days in one year. So you've got, you put that, you know, whatever years that you've got left to live to be 100. So you put that year there into 100. Right? So, so many days you have in life. Now let's go a little further into 24. Okay. So that into 24 will give you how many hours that we have. Yeah. Yes or no? Okay, did, did everybody understand? Okay, okay, do that. So, so whatever answer that you have, hundred minus your age, you got a number. That into three sixty five, you got a number. That is the number of days that you have. So that into twenty four gives you the number of hours that you have. Yes, you got a big number. Okay, so that into let's do, go further into sixty. Yeah, so that into 60 gives you how many minutes that you have from now till 100. Okay, if you live to be 100, you have so many minutes. Calculate well, okay? Get all the zeros correct. Don't leave out, leave out a digit, right? So, so many minutes that you have. We're not talking about eternity. We're talking about this side of eternity, right? Where we can make a difference in people's lives, where we can have a lifestyle of worship. We're talking about this side. Of eternity, right? So many minutes are there. Yeah. Okay, you got a number. Everybody is doing that. Okay. Okay. So then into 60 again. That gives you number of seconds, right? And even as you write down those, make that calculation and write down a number of seconds, some seconds have already gone, elapsed, right? It's, it's already gone, right? So you have so many seconds. It's a big number, right? So many, but it's these are seconds. This is just ticking like that. So it's a, it's something precious. Okay, resource is something that is precious. Resource is something that is useful. Resource is something that you know you can be generous with. It's actually your life. If you look at time, time is your life, right? So it's a resource. But it can be used to help others. It can be used to, you know, to be with people, to enable people, to be kind to people, to help people. You can use your time, right? Maybe to build up people, solve people's problems, bring something, you know, some kind of a comfort to them. Just being with them. Sometimes just being with people in silence, not just giving a big sermon. Right? Just being with them in silence gives much strength and comfort, especially when we are going through some very difficult times. Right? But th these many seconds and minutes and hours and days that we have, years, is a resource. Right? And we can use it in order to help people, strengthen people. And that's, that's again, it's a lifestyle of worship. Right? You're using your resource to help people. You're using a resource to be generous with people. You're using a resource to be kind, to express kindness and action. That is also, you know, a lifestyle of worship. So it goes beyond a song, definitely. Yeah. And it's, it's so much more. Okay. So fourth one, not to be selfish, but to share with um, others what we have. Okay. So, so this is something that we, we see uh, as something that is bigger, much bigger and definitely more fulfilling when we look at life itself as a life of worship to God. Right? God is pleased. God is pleased because we are being Christ-like in all these situations. Right? We are being like Christ in all these situations. Okay, let's look at another aspect. Okay? This is about giving. And it's, it's specifically about giving financially. Right? Okay. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 
6 to 15. Okay, Second Corinthians chapter 9. And it, it talks about how one should give. Okay. Motive for giving, how one should give. And it's very interesting to see that. Okay. Let's read through the verses and then we'll uh, we'll look at um, some aspects of this. Okay. Second, Second Corinthians 9 was verse, verse 6, right? But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. But let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. For God is, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Okay, So we learned several things here about the heart posture, about how God considers the giver. And what does God see? What does God uh, experience when he sees someone who is generous, someone who is giving? Okay, So this is, uh, this is what we see. So first one we see, okay, verse 6 says, he who spares, who is so sparingly will also reap sparingly. Who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So it talks about you know giving bountifully. Okay. So it talks about the one who is a cheerful giver. Okay. Which verse says that? God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 7. Let each one give. God loves cheerful giver. So it's saying, okay, we are talking about one who is giving cheerfully, which means giving. Uh, with happiness, giving in a good mood. Um, what is the opposite of that? Giving grudgingly, stingily, you know, giving, not giving wholeheartedly. So you can give, which means you can give cheerfully or we can give the opposite of that. Right? But really, God is saying, you know, I want you to give whatever you're giving. It's not like, you know, piles and piles of cash. It's not that. Whatever you're giving, even if it's a small thing, a very small thing, in your own eyes, but you do it cheerfully. God loves a cheerful giver. So the cheerful giver gives bountifully. Okay. The second thing that we see in verse 7 is that let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Okay. What does that mean? What does it mean to purpose in your heart? Yeah, but what does it mean to purpose? Like Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not defile himself with the king's food. Purposing in your heart, what does that mean? Yeah, you you purpose. You want, um, you decide. You choose. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Elkanah. That's that's what it is. Right. You decide. You purpose in your heart. So it means it's a personal thing. It's a personal choice. Right. So a cheerful. Sometimes we think okay. Um, maybe someone will force it, and we are afraid of giving like that. You know? We are afraid of giving because you know we feel forced by others. We feel that we have to live up to others' expectations. Right? But what if they think that it is too small? What if God thinks that it is too small, that it is not enough? But God gives the freedom. And you see how liberating this is, saying, you give as you purpose in your heart. 
So which means that you're having the conversation with God, maybe you're just thinking, God, okay, how much should I help this person with? And or maybe how much I should, you know, give financially to the work of your kingdom, whatever it is. God is saying, hey, you purpose in your heart. You decide in your heart. Be a cheerful giver, first and foremost. You know, give it cheerfully. But you purpose in your heart. He's giving that freedom to us. You decide, you purpose in your heart. Okay. So so we each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. Okay, which means that, oh, that's the next thing. No. Oh, I have to give. I'm forced to give. Something bad will happen if I don't give. Right? Don't give out of necessity. Don't give because somebody is forcing. Don't give because of others' expectations. Right? People are watching. You know, what if I don't give? Don't. Don't do that. Don't do grudgingly, which means hesitatingly, half-heartedly, uh, or, you know, because sometimes it can happen, right? And sometimes, I mean, I'm sure we have experienced that, you know, people give and then they do it grudgingly and then you feel bad for having taken that, right? And so the Lord is saying, don't give grudgingly, don't give out of necessity, but do so um, wholeheartedly, right? So it says here that, the cheerful giver, God loves. God loves such a kind of a person who gives in this manner. Right? And the next thing we see is that this is the experience of the cheerful giver. Okay? The one who gives as he purposes in his heart. And we see in verse 8. Okay? So what is that we see? It says, and God is able. Talks about the ability, the, the power of God. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Again, enablement, freely given gift, that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. So this is really God's desire. This is God's heart, right? Saying, okay, you are giving. Now I want to make sure that you have all sufficiency in all things, which means your needs, and I want to make sure that it's taken care of. That's God's heart. Why? Because he's a heavenly father. Right? He's, that's a father's heart. He doesn't want to withhold anything from his child, right? from his children. So he's saying that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Right? Over and above that, that, that you may have an abundance to help people generously. And that's really the father's heart. Right? Whether it's grace, whether it's forgiveness and mercy and love, that's God. That's God's character. That's God's nature. Right? So that is what we see here. It's saying that you may have an abundance for every good work. And uh, so verse 11, it says, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, that you are enriched for even more generosity. Right. So that's God's heart. We are enriched for even more generosity. Many times we hold back because we want to be careful. True. We need to be discerning. We need to steward what God has given to us. Well, we can't be foolhardly. We can't be just be wasteful. Right. But here he's talking about when it comes to personal giving, helping people, when you when you make a choice and then when you do it, saying that. Verse 11, you, well, you are enriched in everything. So God's heart is to enrich us because he's the one who gave, came to give us life and life in its fullness. To enrich us in everything while we are enriched for all liberality, for even more generosity. That we are enriched to have that freedom to help others, to have that capability to help others. Right. So that is really God's heart. And it says that when we do that, this causes God to be glorified. It turns out to be a testimony to God where you say, you know, it's not me. Sometimes we, you know, when we give, we give anonymously, right? You don't announce it and say, you know, okay, I'm giving, take a picture. You know, many times we, that, that is the trend today, right? You want to give with a lot of fanfare, with a lot of, you know, publicity and it's all, you know, but sometimes you just give the way God expects us is like, let not people even know. Let them not even know from where it's coming, from where the help is coming. But that turns around to be a testimony which glorifies God. Where they turn around and say, God, 
you are good. You are good. Yeah, you have a question? No. Uh, you are good, right? And, and God is glorified. It turns out to be a testimony to God. Um, someone has a question? Um, okay. So, so this is something that we see, right? In terms of giving, in terms of giving of finances, uh, and specifically this is about giving, maybe giving to the work of ministry and so on. So saying, you know, go do it in this manner, right? So, okay, we'll take a break and uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes. Thank you.